I'm finally, finally made it happen. What's going on, Hamilton? Doing well, man. Doing well, Anthony. It's a pleasure to be here and to be uh, connecting. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I, I feel the energy coming through the cameras, coming through the computers. So, Hamilton Garces, uh, let's just get to it. What's up? How's life? Talk to me. It's been an interesting journey. Um, yeah. I'm 32 this year, and um, there's probably a point in my life where I probably wouldn't think I lived to see past 30. And um, as I move and I breathe every day, I'm thankful to the Creator, thankful to God, thankful for life, to just be able to be sharing the gift, to be present. You know, I got my senses, I got my body, I can get myself up every morning, dress myself, you know, I can feed myself, you know, do things for myself. So I, I gotta be grateful for that. And um to be here is a is is a journey. You know, everybody has their their story, everyone has their uh that thing that has pushed them or propelled them to want to to move forward to kind of, you know, get to a higher, if not a more better vibration than somewhere we used to be you know because there was a point in my life where i wasn't in the best mindset i wasn't in these high frequency vibrations wanting to think better about myself which allowed me to kind of have a better outlook towards the world and you know so um to be here is to to be living that life to be living the gift so i'm grateful for that presence and um you know i'm grateful for us to connect because it's kind of like a big round circle how we're connected. Uh, yes, you know, you know me through uh, Pavel, and Pavel is uh, the gentleman who I who wasn't the my recruiter at the time, and so um, it's kind of interesting to be us connecting to here to where we're at now, um, where he kind of like told you like, hey, connect with my boy Hamilton. You know, you guys might click to what you're you guys are doing, and I like what you're doing with your podcast. Um, we're both kind of in the same sense of just expanding and then, you know, kind of wanted to share what we do or share consciousness with other people. And so uh, it's kind of tough in the world when we is to find other men who have an open heart and who are kind of showing up hopefully with not a, a lot of ego. Yeah. I feel, I feel everything comes full circle and I think vulnerability and just knowing how to be sensitive and being in touch with your feminine energy is like one of the more, most masculine things that us as men could do, mm. you know? So let's kind of, so let's just, let's just start in the beginning when you weren't in that higher frequency, was this pre, pre, uh, military days? And if so, just tell me what your life was like before you decided to join the military mm. and what your frequency was like. So, kind of like before the military, I, you know, I'm the class clown, I'm like kind of a funny guy everywhere. And I, I grew up in, I grew up in Patterson between 2011, excuse me, 2001. And I graduated up to 2010. So I, I lived in Patterson for about nine to 10 years before moving out of Patterson during the military. So my life before that was just kind of like, you know, any other kid from the city, just, you know, working, taking care of your car, whatever <laughs> hoopty we could afford at that time. For me, it was a $3,000 Honda Accord, <laughs> cherry red, I remember it, 90, 94, 97. Um, and just, you know, hanging out with my friends, into sports and things like that. But, uh, the only thing of what really was a huge difference is like a huge spirituality shift, you know, just like the respect for life, the respect for the things, you know, wasn't someone that would pray, you know, wasn't someone that would uh, give moments towards these sacred times, sacred moments, those special moments. Um, I was somebody that kind of was like, you know, raised Catholic. I would honestly curse the church. I wasn't someone who was like a believer. So, you know, you could call me an, an atheist at, at a time. You know, that would probably make so much in my family. Be like, oh my God, how can you, how can you think that if we raise you Catholic, we raise you like this? But like for me, I just, 
really didn't believe. You know, I didn't have a connection. I didn't feel what some people would feel in different practices or whatever it is to anything higher, higher than us, a higher source of life, consciousness. Um, so for me in life, my mom kind of told me that, you know, one day you're going to find out who God is the hard way. And wow. I really didn't understand what that meant. And in Spanish, it comes off a bit more like intimidating because like, you know, to me, my mom, everything comes to her, comes to me from her in Spanish. So when she says it, like, you know, like one day you're going to learn who God is like at the worst times, the baddest times. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, Bob. And uh, honestly, a party didn't really have anything really traumatic besides like, you know, breaking my arm getting an incidents that kids would do just like, you know, having a boxer fracture from like punching the wall or like jump, jumping out of a tree. I've broken his arm like three times. And so, you know, being involved in like gangs or anything like that, or like just in the streets growing up in Patterson really wasn't my lifestyle. I was a good kid that still like respected their family because I feared them out of fear. I'm going to be home before the lights before the street lights turn on. So I'm going to be home because I know I, I don't want to piss off my dad. You know, it wasn't because like, oh, I love my parents so much. I'm going to, you know, I was just, we did it out of fear. You know, my parents said to do this. I'm going to do it because I'm not trying to break the rules. But I, I was a bit of a, fool, a, a rule follower. Yeah. But um, still didn't like being told what to do. And so somehow I ended up in the military. I thought it was a, a good decision. But like a lot of kids growing up in uh, the early 2000s, 9-11 was like a pivotal point for me because I grew up in Patterson and I'm like 11, 10 miles from the city when it happened. And, you know, I remember when they fought in the TV and the first tower got hit and the second plane is coming down, like in the skyline, like looking out the window, we can see it. And I'm like, looking at the TV, looking outside, looking at the TV and it's all happening live. And I'm like, y'all see that plane? And me and my boy, like looking out the window and we see it. It happens and then it happens on TV and I'm just like, this is wild. As an 11 year old kid, excuse me, as a 10 year old kid in 2001, I'm like just mind blown. To me, this is like the wildest thing I've ever seen. And so somehow in my mind, I just felt like my perspective of that time was get the bad guys, you know, rah, rah America type idea, you know. Um, so I thought I'm doing the right thing. So I go join the military, join the infantry. Uh, you know, my recruiter, Pavel, actually tried to tell me, he's like, you know, there's other jobs so I'm going to the infantry. And I was like, nah, nah, man, I, I want to do infantry. That's what I'm going to do. I want to do infantry. He's like, but you know, you could do this and you could do that. And I was like, nah, nah, I just want to do infantry. I don't want to do, I don't want to be a pogue. That was my ideology. I didn't want to be a pogue, a person other than a grunt. I wanted to become a grunt. I wanted to see, be the tip of the spear, if you will. Um, what was the driven point? Like, what was I really seeking? I I, I don't know. I just went because I thought it was the right thing to do and, like, the greatest honor, especially what they put us in our mind in the military, in the Marine Corps, this Spartan mindset is that the greatest honor is dying in the battlefield, you know? So when I went to Afghanistan at 20 years old, yeah, I signed a contract at 19, but at 20, I had to accept that, like, when I go on that plane, I'm going to go over there, I'm probably going to die. I'm most likely going to die. The stories that these guys are telling me, the people that they lost, the things they witnessed, I don't think my recruiter or many other people could have probably warned me or told me enough stories. Like, I mean, I've watched documentaries, but, like, there's a difference watching it, there's a difference playing the video game, and there's a difference of being there and breathing it. The moment I knew I was in the shit was the moment I walked out of the plane in Afghanistan, and I feel like heat like a heat wave, like you just open up an oven when we walk out that door. And I'm like, man, those engines are really hot. And then we're like maybe a hundred meters away. And I'm like, oh, that's that's just the the oven we're standing that's in. That this Afghani is just heat. <laughs> this the air is different. It's like I'm on another planet. I can't believe that this is Earth. I it was it was it was very surreal. So that's like the first reality of like now I'm somewhere where I didn't think I would have read be really would be and you know reality hits you that i'm like all right i'm not in patterson anymore I'm not at home I'm not with my family and i don't have comfort i'm re i really did put myself in a position of going through uncomfort 
because it's something you have to the warrior mindset in the military is like get comfortable with being uncomfortable and you know at the time i'm like oh you know that's very helpful information because you have to get uncomfortable you have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable there are lessons that i learned in the military that i do carry with me in a lot of the practices that i do which is teaching people like especially during the ice bath like for you to get to this different space a different perspective you have to get comfortable and the uncomfortable and for some people the ice bath is very uncomfortable the the body does is does one thing it wants to fight it wants to fly and run away but like when we experience certain things of conditioning we have to break cycles and so in the in the most extreme chaotic way we have to break cycles of going to become something we warrant which is become the wolf at the door you know but the same way that other people can go through sort of meditative things or certain experiences that at first will be uncomfortable, it's helping them break certain patterns to experience something different. And so for most of us in combat, we experience the highest high of high. And so before I experimented with psychedelics, I experimented with ayahuasca and most of all these ethogenic plants. To me, the highest high of the experience I've ever had was being in combat. It was a feeling greater than sex. It was a feeling greater than than drinking. And so something I see that does affect people after coming from combat is their adrenaline junkies, you know? So like the seeking of like the needlessness to fill empty holes of a man of war is the vices of sex, abusing of alcohol and drinking. I was a I victim I became a victim of that because I didn't know how to seek something that I didn't know I didn't have because no one showed me that no one taught me that and so for me going through my dharma yoga dharma means like your path it led me to experiencing witnessing hurting myself meaning like I put myself in these places right I could have gone anywhere else in the world I could have gone to college but I chose to do that. And so it was my decision, my purpose of the journey of the warrior. But through that journey, through that pain and suffering, I would have never learned how to appreciate life. I wouldn't learn to come back and like hug my mother and be like, damn, I'm so sorry for all the times I've ever been like, ew, I don't want that food. It's cold. I don't want to heat it up in the microwave. Like how selfish of me. And for a lot of other people to be like, damn ham, I don't, I mean, like, that's great to know, but I don't need to go to Afghanistan to like, be humbled like that. Whatever I have gone through in my life had made me in a place of like, you know, what, what my mom might have said, you know, that is like ungrateful, you know? And maybe that might have been because my family comes from the mountains of Colombia. You know, I'm talking about my mom was one of nine children. My father was one of six kids. So like, I was the one and only kid until my sister came into the picture. And I'm the first generation in America. So there's something about the American lifestyle I will say that can spoil us to a certain degree, you know? So uh, I think one of the reasons I joined the military is because my family would say, you know, you just had it so easy in your life. You're an American. You don't know how easy you have it. You know, you, you, I used to have to walk three, three kilometers to go to school when I was your age and up a mountain and zip line through a valley or some shit. But, um, <laughs> They're right. They're right. I, I don't know what that meant. I don't know what it meant to go milk the cow and go get collect your eggs from the chip. I didn't know what that was. You know, I went to school my whole life. I, I go and here's my three meals. I go and get dropped off. I you know, so we do have a sense of like um a privilege, you know. I, I guess I'm thankful that my family came here, gave me a better life. But like there's times that my family will say, like, you know, this great life kind of gave you too much. You know, you, my family would go to Colombia and she'd be like, listen, your, your, your son says chicken nuggets. We don't know what that means. We just keep saying he don't want Sancocho. He don't want, he don't want the, what's on the grill. He don't like the, the fish. He says chicken nuggets. It's like, oh, that means fried chicken. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So, you know, I, I the Marines put, f filtered me to the things that made me learn like, yo, when you're hungry, you got to eat what's in front of you. You know, when 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 you don't got it like that, you just gotta you gotta learn to endure. So something that made me endure through the Marines was like 
I would think about, damn, if I think that this is hard, what my mom went through is harder. My mom's a U.S. citizen now, but she came here in the 80s and backpacked from Colombia through Panama, like a lot of other people's family did migrating here, you know? And my mom came here in the 80s, hardcore, came to Cali, Mexico in the 80s. And when I think about what that woman had to go through, and, you know, like that is my strength to be like, you know, my family has fought a battle. They have fought a war. They fought to come live a better life to escape civil war in Colombia, you know, because of the guerrilla, which is like the Taliban of Colombia. You know, we're looking, we're talking about guerrillas of uh, creating a, a, an unstable environment for people. So for my family, they escaped Colombia in a sense to have a better life. And um, I don't know what that was a struggle. So moments when I thought like, dang, I'm struggling. I thought my, my family has been through more than I have. I literally signed that contract. Like, I'm going to go do this. My family had to, there was no contract. They just moved into your life because the life, the hardness of life was pushing them either to assimilate or like suppress yourself or like get the hell out. There's nothing else for you to do. So like my people seek a future. So it kind of brings me to that place of like, I needed to know what it was to go through some shit. And some people would be like, you know, some people would say that. I, I wanted to experience life. I wanted to know what it's like to go to combat. I didn't say I want to know what it's like to kill a man. I just wanted to know and witness, like, what is what is life? Like, show me life, you know? And for instance, in, in reality of, of being in combat, I witness that life is so sacred. Life is short. On the day that I dislocated my hip and in the ambush by the Taliban. On that day, I was pinned down by machine gun fire in 2000, 2011. And it was it was November 9th. And I won't forget that day because the next day is my mom's birthday. And the next day is the Marine Corps birthday. And on that day, when I got picked up, the firefight's over, the guys get arrested. They have to medic back me back to the base by truck because I couldn't walk at all. And like, it was those moments, it's like also not to take away from the camaraderie, like the brotherhood, like the love, the support of the people that are there. I ain't never felt more love and support than people having your back than the guys you have on the battlefield, you know? And um, it really showed me that, you know, these guys, are, regardless if we're not family, it doesn't take blood to make them. And that's what made us be connected with one another. That's what... Because if we're all out here trauma bonding, out here together, we, we're all united through this, you know? And it was witnessing the things that happened in combat, what happened to men, what happened to people, to realize that, like, later on, like, you know, it's it's, it's kind of fucked up. Like, war is, is, is very, it's very real. And it's very ancient. It's been around for so long. And it kind of made me think about, like, you know, what is, what is the lesson here? Like, are we actually fighting for a just reason? Or like, is this, is every country going to fall and create? And this is just the thing that's going to keep happening. So for me, after my first term, my first uh, deployment in Afghanistan, I kind of was like, I don't know if I can keep doing this. Because to be honest, man, it made me feel something inside of me, ancestrally, woken up like I there's a moment in my life where I remember being in Afghanistan kind of crying thinking like you know these kids are looking at us these people look at us and it's like they're scared of us and they fear us and it's not until I take my glasses off and my helmet that they can see like I'm human like that especially me because like I get real moreno like this I get real dark in the sun so the people will be like Afghan Afghan like trying to talk to me and I'm like no no I'm from South America you know I'm, I'm a different metanated brother um, but something that made me think about was like, what are we doing here? It made me think about like the Aztecs or the Mayans that like looked at silver armored Spaniards coming to their world on horses and this these tools and these technologies. Like, there's people in Afghanistan that literally thought that like helicopters were like some sort of flying magical machines that like shot magic things and created these fires. And I'm like. To people that have been living a certain lifestyle that are not exposed to certain things, I can understand why you are intimidated by that. 
but like it's witnessing intimidation that like it makes me see the human in people like it's so fucked up that like we had to be seeing things like that to, to see human and to be honest there's a lot of my friends that just stayed in it because like they I th you know there's people who kind of get out the military and I see the same pattern of like the love of power is now gone but I still see people go to the things that are going to make them comfortable with patterns, meaning like authority, like firefighters or cops or like things like that, where I can still see like people, you know, especially my friends in the cops or in the police force, I can still see like that authority figure there. And that's, it's good as long as it's like a healthy and like not a toxic authority figure. I think that there's very healthy ways to be a leader and very toxic ways of being a leader. The military will show you the toxicity of extreme masculinity, but then healthy masculinity. And to tell you the truth, I've met very, I met a handful of people in the military as leaders, like officers and higher ups that I can say that like war solid dudes, like heart, soul and spirit, solid dudes. I will follow that person into combat and die along your side because like they got heart. Like they talk the talk and they walk the walk and it's not do as I say, not as I do. That's the difference between like what inspired me to be like a better leader, a better man was to have good examples of healthy men in life. And to be honest, there's a lot of unhealthy masculinity in the military. And so uh, I'm very grateful to have met the men that have been inspirational for me. Which, you know, reminded me, like, things in combat that happened to me, like, spiritual things, that I would be like, hey, man, you probably would think I'm fucking crazy, but I swear to God, like, this voice, like, I heard a voice, and I heard it, and it said, stop, and my body froze, and it said, look, and I look, and that's how I found this 80-pound IED bomb in the ground. And they're like, I believe you, son. And so there's something there about, like, the hair of the dog that shows that, like, the people who've been to combat, something happens there. Something awakens. It's an instinct. And it's very unspoken that the instinct, when we're at fight or flight, like the only reason why I'm here is because I listen to spirit. When you're at the death's door, there's nowhere else for you to fucking go but inside and listen. Or you're just going to combo and break, bro, because I swear to God, I've seen men who you think would be the, the tough macho man in combat. They're the first ones to go into a bowl and start crying for their mom. And I've seen men who you wouldn't even think will have the heart do things that will amaze you. And that's because, like, it's the moments that make you or break you. Like, are you really going to tap into that warrior spirit? Because it's a spirit that it's instinctive. I don't care if you're black, white, brown, where you come from. We are indigenous people, inhabitant of the earth. That's where we are. Countries and borders. This is going to surpass some of my veterans' friends, and it, I get it's going to piss them off. But when we reach certain points of like enlightenment or like in the sense of expanding our consciousness, there are no borders, there are no countries, there are no flags. These are all things, constructs, and realms and spaces for people that created rules because they took power to create. And all I can say in the end is that war showed me we're all human, we all bleed. As much as the Taliban have their fucked up ideologies, they wake up and they're praying and raising to fight us in the same way we were raised and praying to fight them. In each eyes of the Supreme, we're doing a just reason to get rid of the evil. And that's some place of the Jedi balance of like the Sith and the lightness where people can't understand like there's, there's always going to be good and evil on this planet. And I don't really believe that uh, that the only way we could bring peace is if we find peace with one another within ourselves. You know, I, I think that it's going to be hard to, to, to witness everyone laying guns down, laying arms down. So, like, sometimes my ideologies might freak some people out, but, like, the, the reality is, like, I've seen what humans do to one another. I've seen what they're capable of. And, like, this is, like, what we are observing of the observing eye. Like, I don't see no news cameras showing us what's happening right now in Afghanistan since the Taliban taken over. Y'all don't want to be over there. But I also don't see nobody doing anything about it. So the thing is, it's like, it's it's a scary thing. You know, so all I 
All I can do is walk in the way I'm at or I go and bring peace with me, Anthony. That's all I can do. When I step into rooms and I facilitate uh, yoga sessions because I'm a sound healer, a yoga teacher, I facilitate meditative experiences for people to witness themselves through the vibrations and frequencies of sacred sounds, right? And I promise you in the most weirdest way for most people who've gone to combat, a sound that's sacred to us is the sound of a gun. Knowing that that gun is going down range and not coming to us. We know the sound of it going that way. We know the sound of it coming this way. And those sounds, although scary, something I learned through the practice is that all sounds are sacred. I had to be blessed to have ears to hear that what's coming my way because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for sound. And so why I like to show people, people who have PTSD relate sounds to a lot of things. I'm one of them. I used to be very snappy to firecrackers, just when it snaps and pops. But that is only a pattern that could get fixed if not regulated. If unregulated, the patterns are going to keep repeating. I used to be an unregulated person. When I learned to trust that what's happening, but first, regulate your system. Understand we're not in danger. That's first. Two, it's not a gun. It's just some sound that sounds like a gun. Remind yourself you're safe. There are a lot of heads they can't step into that space of knowing that i'm safe they're in the constant of the enemy's always out to get me and that's the mind like that's your ego became someone to protect you but now your own ego is also the one chasing after you it's become your own shadow chasing you and i've witnessed a lot of my friends who get stuck up that like i don't like big crowds for this reason i don't like this for that and it's like bro we're not we're not there no more like it's been 10 years you know, I get it. Like, it's that. But, like, you have to remember, like, you're safe. You've been safe for three, for so many years. It's the story that's up here. And that takes a lot of people a lot of time to not believe the story anymore. But, you know, they, they became they became that identity, you know, that that warrior, you know. But um, I definitely want to let's get into, like, the sound healing and, and Reiki and yoga. But... Would you before we get into that? Would you say? Would you say being deployed, that awakened your spirituality, that awakened those senses and that appreciation for life and and, and gratitude overall. For me, my dharma and for me and my path, I believe that it did serve me. And that I get asked today, like, would you do it again, Hamilton? Like knowing that all of this and all the beauty, all the love that you speak, like knowing would you go back and be that chaotic person is like, I, I had to. I had to go through the chaos, through the storm to witness the, you know, the tr trueness. The, 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 the truth is like, once I went there, I saw everyone for being human. Like I saw God in people. And even though like we, like, I can't tell you I've ever killed a man. Like, I can't confirm that. I can't tell you that. I don't know that. God knows that. The Supreme Consciousness knows that. Whoever is watching may know that. I can't ever tell you that. But what I know is that there being out there, it made me witness that we are all God in the sense of the divinity, the sacredness, that life. Like, I wouldn't witness that and where I've gone and what I've experienced. And so for me to get closer to God, I had to find stillness. And to this day, I would tell people like Afghanistan, I, if it was a better place right now, if it, was, if it wasn't, if it was moved Taliban and it's just being a happy, open country as it used to be in a sense of freedom, it's a beautiful country. It's a country that has ancient history, so much culture, like not just besides of like, I like think the people that are there, but like the ancient history, the people who walked through there, you know, so it kind of made me like, I felt like I was in a time capsule. So it made me realize like, I had to come here to witness something. I had to come here to see that like these people are strong people, resilient people, spiritual people. And like, they've been oppressed from Alexander the Great to the Russians to this and to that. And like, these people have keep fighting and nothing will take them down. And like, what is it? And I see that these people are close to God. I see that these people are close to source. Just like the indigenous people are. They give what they can and they invite you into their homes. People would invite us to their homes to give us tea, give us food. Knowing that like I should be the one that you should be mad at. But they say, 
we we know a law called Pashtuwali. And Pashtuwali represents like if people are it's like the the story of Christianity is like, you know, uh if you are weary, come rest your head. And like that it was that moment of of humility to witness in the middle of combat the gentleness of sitting under the shade with these people and sharing tea and taking my helmet off. I had to witness that humanity to realize like life wasn't as bad as people thought it was over here. Like it's just the evilness that is coming, which is, you know, war. And I saw these people to be happy. So it taught me to like, I need to learn to be happy. These people have nothing and to me nothing. It's like the people up in the countries from the mountains when we hear about people talking about Puerto Rico or Dominican Republic or Haiti or up in the mountains or Latin American ancestors talk about what it's like to have nothing. These people got nothing. They walk around barefoot, yet they're so happy. And so that what I took away from that was like, you know, appreciate what you have, Hamilton. I had to appreciate. I didn't appreciate. And so coming back, it made me appreciate. It made me witness that, like, I can't go around thinking that, like, life means nothing and that when you die it's you know no one's going to care about you i see what happens i see how families react when people die it's a huge transition in life it's like ripping out a, a piece of, of you that you that know you know that was always there but now it's gone like a phantom pain so through death i had to witness life and it brought me to understanding that everything anything i could do in his life is bring more vitality more life source more life force more life energy and all i was doing after the military was destroying that life energy which led me to basically destroying my body going through alcoholism and stuff like that if it wasn't for me going through that pain of like oh my god what did i do in afghanistan was i was i right was i wrong why are my friends dead who committed suicide? Like, why Why can't they, why, why do I have to still be here and suffer all this pain of life? Like, why can't, why can't I just be gone? Like, wouldn't life be better if I disappeared? But through my dark night of my soul, the, the reflection, the question asking, I wouldn't be where I'm at if I didn't sit with those questions and realize that I found the right people in my life that come to me, people who led me to yoga, people who led me to tap into meditation, breath work, or Reiki. I would have died by my hand had I not listened to the to God sharing, like, hey, here's 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 something to it. And I, you know, I I probably had strike two before I probably would have gone down for my life. In a sense of like that story where they say, you know, a gentleman's lost at sea, God sends a boat. And the gentleman says, go away. No, I don't need your help. God's going to send send help when he can. A uh, helicopter comes and it's like, hey, we can help you. And God's like, no, no. The guy's like, go away. God's going to help me. He's going to save me. And all right, all right, bye. And then one last guy comes in, in the little rowboat. And he's like, come, come on, man. Let me help you. He's getting bad out here. He's like, no, God's going to help me. He's going to save me. Eventually, the man drowned. When he gets to heaven, the story is, he goes to God, he's like, God, why, why didn't you save me? Why didn't you help me? He's like, do you not remember I sent you the ship? Did you not remember I sent you the helicopter? Do you not remember that I sent the man on the boats? That story shows me, like, all right, when you see God putting it here in your hand, whether it's like, hey, man, go and fuck yourself and go do some rehab. You might meet someone there that might change your life. If it's not a practitioner, it's someone's story in there that's going to help you be like, damn, I thought I had it bad. I guess it's not that bad. And and I I need to learn to like get rid of these things and be better. And to be honest, it's it's the pivotal points of meeting people that made me believe. Some people were like, you should check out yoga, man. It's good for you. You know, if you don't like going to church, go go to go to the temple. What the fuck does that mean? Go to the temple. It wasn't until practicing yoga within the first year I started understanding what they meant by that. My vessel is the temple, my body is the temple. We will do anything to burn and destroy ourselves down right the the self-inflicting things i did as a veteran wounded warrior was that i was trying to burn my temple down because i didn't see the beauty of me being alive anymore and see like what's the worth of life so i learned to cherish my temple yoga taught me hey connect yourself like body mind and spirit remember in the military the spirit of core the spirit of the warrior the spirit of the corpse like we are body, mind, and spirit. Remember what the Shaolin monks taught. Remember what 
all these warriors taught. They weren't just savages and killers and murderers. Like warriors meant to be so great that you can contain the peace. To be so peaceful is to also be so violent. And it made me realize like, holy shit, all the things I've gone through, all the violence, all the horror, all the chaos, basically showed me how I don't want that in life. I don't want to live in a life where people are so scared and people are running. And it's it's a terrible thing to witness. I had to understand that, like, I just want peace. And so, like, to be here today is to understand peace after war. And, like, a lot of people don't find the peace after war. They keep living war and hell every day. And, you know, heaven's a mindset. Yoga, Reiki, sound healing, these are tools to shift your perspective to bring you into the reality, like, right, what's here right now. And so, to tell you the truth, when I step into the room, I wish I had more men. I wish I had more warriors. But there's a lot of the feminine that shows up. And that's okay. Because the feminine keeps holding space for the masculine. Whether that means they're helping their husband out or their son or their nephew. Giving something. Women in my life gave me these tools to get closer to myself. But when I do have men in the room, because the women share all these great experiences with the sound and the visions and the feelings and the emotion and the releasing through tears or through the breathing and expansion, the men, I love when men show up because they're like, I don't know about this yoga, this mumble jumble stuff. Then they hear my story and they're like, you know what? Uh, if it worked for this kid, I I'll give it a try. I I'll check it out. You know, this kid seems like he's gone through some shit. I I I'll see what this is about. And then they go through it and they do the drumming and they breathe and they hear the didgeridoo and, and the conch and these indigenous sounds that I work with, they are of the shamanic nature, like sounds of the drumming, the flute, the didge, animals. But people, their brain begins to illuminate. For people who are like, I don't know what just happened, but I swear, I feel like I'm really high. Like, I feel like I smoked a joint. I haven't done that since high school. Very meats and potatoes kind of guys. And the thing is, it's like, hey, it's a beautiful thing that you were able to be comfortable enough to even share with me. That 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 came that that came for you because from the most straight arrow dude to be like I'm gonna come in and see what this is about and then have these things in the mind and be like I saw this I saw that for a lot of people to be like yeah okay I don't know about that but the thing is it's it's a feeling we're tapping into it's a space it's a timeless memory of ancient knowledge and wisdom that is tapped inside of your DNA. And I swear the most unreligious people I've ever met start talking about the most spiritual things they've ever witnessed or felt. And like things like people saying, I felt my grandmother here. I know that because I wouldn't be practicing this if I didn't feel that too. I've gone to ceremonial experiences with sound that if it wasn't because we just sat with a plant medicine, we're feeling this. We, I can see this. Oh, it's it's the medicine. The chemicals are making me have visions of my family. No, I've been outside of medicine with the sound alone. Sound is the medicine. The breath is the medicine. These tools alone can guide you to an elevated space. And when it's nice to see people tap into this space, they're like, I didn't understand what this yoga stuff was about, but I, I, I have a glimpse. I have a, a tiny glimpse of what that feeling is and like what a beautiful feeling it is to to know that that's actually here that we can close our eyes meditate and go to a space with our awareness that no longer feels like I'm, I'm i am my body like i felt the air i could feel being the trees i could feel the water this may sound very strange to people but these are the practices of indigenous ways that have helped me tap into these sources of consciousness. And so for a lot of people, um, when they come work with me, they're looking to be like, you know, break it down. Like, what are we doing? Because there's a lot of people out here running around doing this stuff or calling themselves a shaman. I don't call myself a shaman. I just call myself a, a shamanic practitioner, like a Buddhist practitioner. It's like calling yourself a Buddha. You you, you ain't there until you... So, it's said it's there or whatever that is. Like there's no claim or title that I'm ever going to be like, this is what makes me the official healer. We're all healers. We're all teachers. We're all students. And I could be 75 and think I still not know anything because I'm still learning. So um, I'm grateful to be given these tools to be a bridge for people because I have people say that 
uh, for the first time, I was able to quiet my mind. And I didn't think that that was possible. And I know, trust me, I'm an Aries sun, Leo moon. I'm a double fire person, very fiery person. I'm active. I'm all over the place. I'm the kid that you shouldn't have given Coca-Cola or chocolate to at the party. But now Hamilton's off the walls. But I'm telling you, when you can tap into the discipline of self, and find the comfort to step into your body, we will realize how much of the mind we are in, that we spend 90% here and forget about this. It's like mushrooms, dude. Like we are we are mushrooms having a human experience. For example, 90% here, 10% here. Like when we see mushrooms, it's 10% of the entire thing. 90% of everything is underneath all the stuff, all the surface. Here's the brain, here's the nerves. Everything is here, and we forget that all of the extension of us, if we took away the skin, the bones, the muscles, the tendons, we're left with the stem and the nerves, which is like a root. Like all of that, it, like that brain is not just here. The brain is the extension of all of us. So when we can tap into the body, get out of the mind and into the body, we can learn to be more present because the mind talks a lot. The mind makes noise. This is why I'm a practitioner of sound. Bringing it to people regardless of no medicine or not, meaning ethogenic plants, psychedelics or not, because the, the breath and sound can bring us into a trance state, a state that will let us feel lighter, a state that allows you to reflect. Like many people say, it's the first time I actually can make my head quiet. And that's, that's the gift to people is bringing silence to them. So they can finally hear their inner voice, if you will. Being a sound healer, and you said we're 90% in the brain and 10% everywhere else. So with sound healing and yoga combined, setting that intention, does that help people, especially veterans, get out of their head and into their body, into their spirit? Yeah, when I feel that I'm able to like break it down for people and like let them know like these aspects. For instance, the science of we're in the mind a lot. This is brain waves. So alpha and beta, these are active brain waves, meaning we're alert, we're awake. If we don't hit REM cycle, if we don't have a, a peaceful life in a routine, that means we go to sleep every night at a comfortable time and we wake up at a decent time that we're not oversleeping, undersleeping, we're in an autonomic state, meaning everything is perfect. Everything is balanced and homeostasis is where we want to reach. <clears throat> Bringing people into the moment of the intention of give me one hour of your attention. Not even me. Give yourself the one hour of this attention. You do work 60 to 40 to 80 hours a week for some people. Then it's the kid and the dog and your car and the bills. Today, give yourself one hour of attention. We are awake, alert brain waves alpha and beta and i tell them if we can really tap into it 20 minutes is enough but 20 minutes meaning after 20 minutes after going through what we're going through they're going to reach this space this is the theta and delta brain waves this is REM cycle anthony this is where people witness that miracle when they're able to understand that like oh okay if i can pay attention to the diaphragmic breathing let my mind get drawn with the sound, meaning like entertain the monkey mind with the sound. It's like, here's a banana and try to go and just let the monkey be quiet in the brain. When we bring the sound healing and understand the body, giving people the tools or the guide to the self allows them to navigate. So now the longest journey is going to be 18 inches from the mind to the heart. You know, and that's going to be that big, uh, excuse me, from the mind to the gut, because 90% of our serotonin is, is produced in the gut. We're shorter of breath, stiffness, shortness in the chest. You have to breathe into the diaphragm. Guiding them to breathe like this really allows people to, it's like I'm not even in the room at times. It's like I'm just a voice on YouTube, just guiding them. Because I'm telling them the truth teacher is yourself, the breath. As they learn to connect with that breath, they finally realize how much they've been holding tightness. Through witnessing that release of pressure, they're now trusting the body. So it's giving people the tools to give attention to yourself, 
But now trust yourself, trust the process. And through trusting that process, they're able to surrender and let go. Because during the moment of vulnerability, and this allows them to be in humility because it's hard for us to be vulnerable. And to be vulnerable is like to to, to switch. You know, we, we just went from a different space, which is protection, walls up, to people becoming vulnerable. And these are the moments for veterans, for men, for women that have come out of sessions being like, this was the first time I was like, I was able to put my armor down. Because I tell, I'll say that, you know, like, life is hard. So we put our armor up. And today, you know, you can put your armor down. It's okay to let your shield down. Like, you're safe. Reminding people that while we're moving through the space and, and drumming or creating the container allows people to realize like how much they haven't given themselves the moments to actually breathe, how little they paid attention to the breath. And because I'll say something along the lines like when we're born, we scream for life because we're, we're smacked. We're smacked and we're celebrated. Yeah, breathe. He's breathing. He's crying. He's alive. You know, we cheer. What a beautiful time to celebrate the breath. When we're near our death, we're praying. We're, we're salvaging the precious moments of what's left of the breath. So in beginning and end, it's in these moments of this journey in the breath and the sound where people can witness like, holy shit. I really got to breathe more. I really, I'm not even breathing as much as I should, I'm not fully with each intent engaging with all the necessary uh, expansion that I need because we're technically limiting yourself. And life is about expansion. Life is about creation. If we're stuck in the mind, stuck in the body, stuck in energy, the breath is going to move things. And so... Science is one thing. The woo-woo is going to always happen. But the science is this. is giving people the understanding that we're cleansing our body. We're detoxing the body. The breath actually releases 70% of toxins. When you give that to people, they're like, okay, this makes sense. So say I've been a smoker. Say I was the pill-abusing person I was. When I started hearing this information, I'm like, okay, my lymphatic system is poisoned. I polluted myself, put impurities and toxins into myself. Detoxing and eating, meaning like flushing my system and doing this can only do so much. My cells need to rejuvenate. How can I clean it even more? The breath will rejuvenate your cells. If you do the breathing properly, you can even feel the tingling, the bubbling sensation of heat or the cellular level activating. We're now increasing down to the cellular level or the mitochondrial is ATP energy. So like, I'm a very science guy and I may come off like very woo woo on the Instagram, but I, I love bringing science to people because like I, as a machine gunner, as a veteran dude with the mindset of show me the system, I needed to understand their Jedi system, which is yoga. Yoga teaches you the system of the Jedi, the way of the Jedi, like learn to use the force, learn how the body operates, become a master of self, and then move through the world and master that. And I think that people need to learn how to slow down. Um, even if you're an expert, it's always great to start from the basics. Um, the roots is the foundation of everything. And my advice for people seeking to start or to do anything is give yourself an opportunity to be vulnerable. Show up to that yoga class that you may be thinking over a year now like oh, i want to go do that or go to that cacao ceremony go to that retreat the women's retreat the men's circle go to that dance uh a static dance whatever it is or go to what's drawing you but you haven't been able to be brave enough to go you know for me i had to be brave enough to step into a yoga room and to stand in the back and feel like oh am i doing this right am i am i not like this should i be doing it like that that's okay. This is the first part of yoga is the expansion of the mind, expansion of self, meaning like <clears throat> one of the yoga sutras, meaning like the laws of yoga or like the discipline of yoga is like, and now, be, uh, now begins the, the, the resistance of mind stuff. The translation of that is basically saying that like, 
now begins the time for you to observe that resistance. Like here I am already resistant. The cross hasn't even started. I'm already resistant. Am I doing this right? Should I even be here? Okay, I'm observing that I'm already judging myself. Okay, be gentle to ourselves. So this is something which is like encouraging because um, I'm not a great, I'm not going to say I'm a great teacher or I'm a great educator. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. And if there's anything I can share with people, like these are my things that I've gone through in my journey that I struggled with, which is like, you know, the things come up. Even today as a teacher, I still have apostle syndrome being like, should I even keep doing this? So what's the purpose of doing this? But then I get reminded by people, men and women, that share moments of, I want to say holiness. You know, it's like these sacred moments of like, you don't know how much this practice helped me today or how much I needed it this, this weekend or like how I can breathe more. And the thing is, it's like, it's not me. I'm attuning myself to hopefully create this safe space for people to, to experience this. And that's what I hope to continue to do is keep learning, keep growing in community and keep holding space with honor and sacredness to allow people to be open. That's the, that's the objective. That's the objective. Of, uh, that's the objective of yoga, right? Allowing people to open. Mm -hmm. Be open, Allowing people that to open. openness, that oneness. Yeah. And it begins with self because the, like the, it's first is the, is the journey through self. You know, you open yourself, you master yourself and union. Yoga means union or yoke. Huge, huge union. You create union, body, mind, and spirit. Once I, once Hamilton understood after combat, holy shit, I'm so much more than this. I'm body, mind, and spirit. I'm this and that. I had to, and then I came back with the community. I learned the yoga of self. I learned the unity of myself. I learned to carry better relationships with others and self. You know, if I'm not respecting myself, you're not treating other people with respect me either. Like that's first thing I can maybe notice when people may be talking to me is like this. I could, I may be able to sense or hint the lack of self-respect some people have for themselves and the way they may speak or move, or like even body language. You know, body language is a huge thing about like, do we have confidence or like, do we have like guilt? Do we have shame? Are we carrying something? So it's very interesting to connect with people. So um, I'm grateful to open that for people to open with community because if we're opening this for each individual to show up, after the end of it, everybody's all happy and they're all like, man, what a good time. And I'm so happy I got to share this moment with complete strangers. But now, like, we all left your friends. We all left you with new connections. And, you know, now I just found out that this person over here went to college with my cousin and they're around the way. And now you're making friends in communities where it's not to say all our friends that high school we grew up with aren't the best. Like, I have a small group of friends I still connect with from after high school. But, like, what I'm trying to say is, like, we need to find people that you know, maybe weird like us, maybe into the things like us. You got to find your, you got to find your vibe that attracts your tribe, right? And so finding your yoga community, finding your ice bath or your sweat lodgers, like there's going to be community wherever it is. It's just going to be great to find people already doing it. So you don't have to feel like you're doing it alone, you know? And like, I think that that's great for people to expand. And then I'm telling you, I've done events where I've had people be like, um, How'd you find our event? And it's like, I just I just heard breath work was good for you or yoga was good. I went on Eventbrite, typed in yoga and breath work, and I found this event. I read it. I liked it. And I, I did not expect I was going to experience all this and like these conversations and the open heartness. Like, wow, like I what a, I wish I could live in a space like this every day, you know? So like my goal in life is hopefully to help create a space for people to come, to sit, to to live and to breathe, you know, I mean, I'm not saying like, I'm going to start a commune, but it's just like, you know, have land, have a space where people could come do a retreat, you know, like only on the weekends, come through here on the weekends, we'll have a farmer's market, we have yoga for the, for the community, we have this going on, or, you know, men's circles and women's circles or community drum circles. These are kind of the things in the sense that like, I hope to envision, which is like potlucks, community, get people connected and network because this is going to bring people to the table 
and in community, what helps people with one another is like, what are we bringing to the table? You know, like, you know, who's who's the vet here? You know, who who knows how to give birth to a cow? Who knows how to who knows how to help build a house or work with metal or, you know, who who hears a psychiatrist, a family psychiatrist, a child psychiatrist? You know, like, where's the networking where we can help? Because what I realize is for a lot of the other upper echelon one percenters percenters of the world is it's all about who they knew and the resources and this and that. In the sense of using things to get higher and better and appreciate other appreciate all the other people in community, the idea is where we can all support and appreciate each other. You know, like if I bring a sack of potatoes because I grew them, it's exchange, you know, things like that. It may be very Bohemian of thinking in a way of life, but I'm, I've been to communities where it's happened. And I, I've seen the spark of creativity. I've seen the spark of hope, you know, because I've seen the I've seen the spark of hell. I've seen the flames. I've walked through it. I've been in the shadows and I've had moments to witness that, like, you know what? There's still places of, of hope, for hope here on Earth because, like. There's, they can't. It, the world ain't always gonna be so gloomy, you know. There's, there's we're all good. There's no evil. We're all we're evil. There's no good. So that's kind of the balance of life and how I see it. The yin and the yang. Yeah. I always, I always pictured myself having my own house and my own farm, and like you said, like in a community, and just leaving some fruits and vegetables outside for people to just grab for free. There's, you don't have to pay for it. Just grab it. Just don't be greedy. Let the yeah, and like have some shit. Let like let people have stuff because like look, man. At the end of the day, people are like, oh, what's all this mumbo jumbo and indigenous stuff? This it doesn't mean you have to be an indigenous native of America to know certain. Look, people of the earth, no matter where you come from, like you could be the Druid, the Celtic, the Vikings, the Mon the Mongols, like whatever it is. Like people from all over the world, all had ways of life to do things to appreciate the earth and so something at the end of the day because in all cultures there's warrior like there's all warlike culture yes we're never going to be able to avoid it but something you can witness in the culture is the honor of the agriculture the honor of the food the honor of sacredness like for instance like uh native americans will teach that we should only take what we're given you know greed the capitalistic colonial mindset of greediness and take and take the abundance and resources isn't going to last us forever take what is take only what's given so take the fruits that have fallen not pick the one that's still it's not ready it's not ready if it was ready it'd be on the ground for you ready for you to receive so there's a lesson take what's given there's a lesson there same thing with firewood it's a waste get that cow what a sin it is to just Hill and then a tree that's still like take what has fallen take the branches that have fallen take the old trees that are died and dried up these are the gifts to you you know like even like if we're gonna pluck a leaf only take what has been given you know same thing so it teaches us like you know we have resources let's not be greedy and take just because we want it let's learn to only take what has been given to us and be thankful for that these are the lessons in life that I, I hope that can echo to people is like we need uh, that can we need to learn to be more more resourceful and grateful and you know not be greedy and to be patient. I hope to live in a world just like the one you mentioned because that's 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 where I see the future going. Maybe not necessarily at the rate that the world is going now. It might not be so soon, but. I'm optimistic that, you know, something great will happen, but, um, I know you, yeah. Yeah, so I know, I know you got to go, but, but, um, I do want to ask you this question because you mentioned the cacao ceremony. Mm -hmm. What, what is, explain to me what the cacao ceremony is and like, what's the purpose behind it? All right. So a cacao ceremony versus what is a cacao ceremony and what is cacao? So cacao ceremony is using a plant medicine and plant medicine means many things people romanticize that word now meaning like a mushroom or a mescaline or ayahuasca but plant medicine means that this plant has medicine it's revered for its medicinal properties and its minerals if you will right um cacao 
when we do it in a ceremonial setting is intention. Cacao is representing the grandmother energy, the divine feminine. So cacao gives us a moment in life to celebrate, to sit with ourselves. And when you drink this cup of cacao, nothing freaky is going to happen. It's just going to help us be more alert in the sense of that um, it's a heart opener. So in the Aztecs and the Mayans, they would use cacao to open your heart. And they would use mushrooms to take you to the heaven's gates. And so in conjunction, these two are very beautiful. But cacao by itself is going to bring you warmth. It's going to bring you love, blissfulness. We are You are activating certain hormones that make you feel happier. But you, in ceremony, we call the four directions. We take this moment to sit with ourselves, to sit with our ancestors. Anytime we sit with ourselves taking cacao, we're calling in the, that grandmother energy. So this is our ancestors that we sit with. And representing with that divine feminine, the Holy Mother, gives us moments to reflect. And so working with that female healing energy, it's like we're sitting with our mom or grandma. And when we sit in ceremony, we do the breath work. Emotions can come up for people. Maybe certain topics or questions that we go through when we start journaling will help bring inspiration to help you along your journey. So for some people that I say, like, if you ever have some stuckness and stuff like that in your heart, or you've been feeling like you need a good cry, like come to a cacao ceremony. Like it's going to help open you up because cacao is, is very good to open things up. So now like, what is cacao? Cacao is a, it's a superfood. It comes from the cacao plants. The plants, this tree makes of fruits. From that fruit comes these seeds. These seeds are dried, roasted, um, dried, fermented, and roasted, and then made into a paste. And what this paste is now is nutrition, rich in iron, magnesium, potassium. Uh, how very healthy for women for moon cycles, but now that we use it in the ceremony is we're taking this medicine and putting it in our body in the sense that we're taking this energy of the divine feminine to bring warmth, to bring gentleness to us, to remind us of how we need to learn to be soft, how we need to learn to be gentle to the self. And in that, we're able to witness the community because for some people, there still may be timidness and I'll see people being able to share in the sense that like, I just had a cacao ceremony this past week and it was a beautiful ceremony. It was open to everybody, but it ended up being more women. I was the only guy, but it was great. It was a very beautiful time to be of service to the divine feminine as a divine masculine to be holding space and to facilitate that it was very um, nice because for, I guess, the divine feminine to feel safe around the masculine, they need to feel comfortable. And so, to be a, a man that can create a comfortable space for people, it's it takes practice. It takes uh, vulnerability to be in a room with a complete stranger, right? And to be vulnerable to share your experiences. And so whatever is ever shared in a cacao ceremony is very intimate. It may be somebody sharing about grief, something that they're going through. Maybe about the loss of something or someone. It may be a shifting aspect in the relationship that is ending or the career or something that needs to move and end. But what we can witness is even if we aren't here to learn so much about ourselves, we can learn about a lot of other people, which allows us to start asking questions and witnessing ourselves in ways we never thought about. And so just like sitting with mushrooms or ayahuasca, cacao is another way to shift our perspective. So like when you're drinking a nice big cup of ceremonial cacao, you're drinking anywhere from 30 to 50 milligrams of cacao. The equivalency of 30 to 50 milligrams of cacao would be like, cacao is healthy and it's stronger than coffee, but when you do in the ceremonial sense, it like, it hypes you up. And the idea of that, like when you're in this cacao ceremony, the music, it's you activated, like you can really feel the vibrations. It's opening you up because right now this this thing is moving through your blood. And so the science and the spirit is there. Um, the cacao ceremony is basically that time to honor. The cacao is a very good plant that helps us open up our hearts. And with science, 
it allows us to understand why it's moving our heart or why it's oxidating the blood. So when you do the breath or when you do the sound, it gets us to a very sensitive state. For some people, they reach a place where they're breathing and they reach this very heightened state where they're like, wow, like I, I can feel the heat or I can feel the coolness moving through my body because of me paying more attention. And some people will leave the session wanting to know how can they use cacao every day in the sense of that we can use coffee every day, but we're not really using it to the best of its potential. In the sense that like coffee on an empty stomach is really bad for us. But if mm. you use coffee after a meal and use it like that, it, it helps you digest better. It helps you move things easier. So using things properly helps us maximize them. So with cacao, people like to substitute their coffee with cacao. What does that do for them? You're learning that every day is a life and a celebration. So take these moments for 20 minutes a day with intention, like the Japanese do with a green tea ceremony. It's an intention. It's, it's connecting. It's respecting and honoring, being thankful for the sacred plant, being thankful for life. And that when you drink this, we carry this medicine in our hearts and we bring this joy with us. We bring this, this pep and people will, and people will feel it. And people will be like, man, you just so happy. It's like, you got to try cacao. Cacao just brings in happiness. It brings in joy. Wow. That was so very in depth, beautiful. And with that said, do you have any like upcoming, any upcoming events, uh, maybe a cacao ceremony or any, uh, uh, sound healing uh, events in the near future? Yeah. Um, so for cacao this month, I don't have anything, but I will be in September 24th. That's a Sunday. Let me see, just to make sure. September 24th is going to be a Sunday. And so on that Sunday, I will be in New York City on 13th Street at Integral Yoga Institute. And I already said it, 13th Street. But I'll be there from 5.30 to 7.30, holding a two-hour session of guided breath work and the shamanic sound experience. And so regardless of not to kind of be in there, two of the things that is like, in a sense, like medicine, you know, because people be like, oh, you're a medicine man. It doesn't mean like, hey, here, drink this peyote and smoke this and do that. No, medicine means sound what we breath. bring. Exactly. Medicine is the breath. Medicine is the heart. Medicine is watching the deer walk through the grass, watching the eagle fly. This is medicine. And so um, we're going to do the medicine of breath and sound, and that's going to allow us to journey. So two hours, New York City, it's going to be a $40 uh, ticket purchase. The link is on my link tree on my uh, Instagram. You can find me at, at mindfulwarrior underscore hammy, H-A-M-I. And that's the best way you can follow me to see any other upcoming events, as well as uh, if you ever need help or resources with wanting to connect things in the wellness stuff with yoga or spirituality, um, I'm open to connect with people, uh, as well as like, you know, connecting people to resources to like plant medicine spaces and ceremonies where there's like trusted churches or facilitated areas that are in a sense giving people a safe mind that when you're doing space here, um, we're protected in the sense that uh, we're not going to be in like some studio on the 20th floor in New York City. And like, you know, any moment the DAA could come in. But the idea is uh, bringing safe spaces to people. So there's legal churches in Texas, California, even here on the East Coast as well. Because for some people, you can't go or afford to go to Peru. It costs a lot of money for flights and expenses and things of that nature. So hopefully I can connect people to those spaces. Other than that, um, that's all that I have going on for this month. And um, yeah, I just appreciate having this moment in time to share with y'all. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm definitely going to leave that information in the show notes on for, for this episode, of course. And I really appreciate you taking this time and really like explaining your journey, your Dharma, right? Did I say that right? Uh, yeah yeah so it just path, yeah just explaining your path in life and how you went from from deployment to spirituality to yoga to reiki i we didn't really get into reiki but you did definitely get into the sound the sound healing which is what i really wanted to know about 
and I'm sure a lot of people were curious about as well. Um, yeah. And, and yoga, of course. Go ahead. Well, the, the, I just wanted to kind of like make it real quick in a sense, like Reiki is just, Reiki is just like an attunement, right? Like how I attune myself to yoga and sound and these other things. How Reiki, how a lot of people like to use Reiki is very one on one and do these group sessions. And like, it's a lot of this hand gesturing thing, but like, I did Reiki in the sense of like, if I'm already here doing these sounds, I need to be more attuned to nature. So Reiki literally translates to universal energy mm -hmm. or like life energy. Ray meaning energy, life, he, so like life energy. The idea again, life force energy. If I'm going to be doing sound, may my intentions be attuned to the highest of good. May I keep going to many schools? May I learn many skills that were tuned me to the right frequencies? And so for me, it was like iron sharpening the iron to make sure when I'm doing my work, I'm calling in the angels. I'm bringing, I'm becoming a, a beacon of light amongst each and other person here who is a crystal, a beacon of light. May we amplify this energy of the space with each of us as a prayer. And so that is like, in a sense, it like a orchestra of energy but with the sound and so i talk very little in the sessions and so i let the sound be the true moving the sound is working the intention of like blowing and breathing is all a meditation of like i'm connecting with the force i'm one with the jedi the jedi means literally one with the force and so that's the thing of, of why bringing reiki to people is important of the sense of doing this with the pure intentions so with the sound you're gonna feel more love more purity because it's coming from a place of innocence a place of you no know, judgment you know so that's allowing me to open myself to the greatest good which is bringing in all, all the source of through the music and through the energy wow that was beautiful and i do hope if people decide to watch it or listen they could feel feel your energy because because it's very contagious it's very powerful even though we're not in the same room i can still feel it so so thank you for bringing that to me thank you for bringing Absolutely. that to my that space and and thank you for being here and i do hope we can connect in the future uh on a face-to-face -face level and let's see how we can connect and build from there so my Hamilton, man, i really thank you for your time um this was dope and i'll see you soon brother Absolutely, Anthony. Much love, many blessings, and, and peace to you. And, and I'll see you. I know we'll connect soon. Next time I'm around Jersey or in the future, we'll, we'll be around the way from each other. So All right. much love and gratitude from afar. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Peace. Thank you.